Hello and welcome to chapter 4 of On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. On the limits to the authority of society over the individual. And in this chapter we will be focusing on a couple key questions. Namely, what is the rightful limit to the sovereignty an individual has over themselves? And where does that sovereignty end and the authority of society begin? <laughs> Although there is not a literal contract, by virtue of being a part of society, we gain certain benefits, specifically the protection that society provides us. And in turn for receiving that protection, we have some obligation to contribute back to society. And this can be having a certain standard of conduct that we should have towards one another, and sometimes even being obliged to contribute directly to the common defense. Now, the foundation of the conduct that we owe towards others is that we're not infringing on their interests or their basic rights. Although this doesn't mean if you're totally avoiding everyone in society that you're in the clear per se. Human beings owe to each other help to distinguish better from the worse and encouragement to choose the former and avoid the latter. They should be forever stimulating each other to increase exercise of their higher faculties and increase direction of their feelings and aims towards wise instead of foolish elevating instead of degrading objects and contemplations. Now, this is not to say that people are in the right to tell each other what to do, because again, nobody knows an individual's self-interest better than the individual themselves. But having this communication with others can help us make better decisions for ourselves and also just be better socially. But we are, for ourselves, the final decision makers for our own choices, and we should bear the negative consequences of our own actions. And if our choices make us people of bad character, and unpleasant to be around, then other people don't have an obligation to put up with it. Just in the sense that they don't have to be around you if they don't want to, and they don't have to pretend that they're cool with it if they're not. And in this regards, Mill is specifically referring to character traits or repetitive negative behaviors like drunkenness, idleness, incontinence, or uncleanliness. And of course, people just not wanting to be around you is very different from them actually forcing you to behave otherwise. We shall reflect that he already bears or will bear the whole penalty of his error. If he spoils his life by mismanagement, we shall not, for that reason, desire to spoil it still further. Instead of wishing to punish him, we shall rather endeavor to alleviate his punishment by showing him how he may avoid or cure the evils his conduct tends to bring upon him. Now there still remains the question, how can one's actions only affect themselves? In the words of Hugh Grant quoting, in the words of Hugh Grant, no man is an island. It's difficult for somebody to do a large amount or permanent damage themselves without affecting at least a little bit their closest relations. Or if they do serious harm to their property, they may be affecting those around who indirectly or directly depend on their property in some way. For example, if I chop down all the trees on my property, less oxygen for everyone. Additionally, if an individual does serious harm to themselves, they limit their ability to fulfill certain parts of the social contract stated before. They are less able to contribute to the common defense, or less able to contribute in what keeps society protected. And even if none of the above are true, the person can still be harmful just by example. Although, to be clear, Mill is saying these crimes of bad character should only be punished socially, because their negative effects on others are really dependent on the social context, the social context in which those actions take place. For example, being a drunk doesn't directly affect anyone. The alcohol is only going within your own body. However, if you happen to have a family that emotionally and financially depends on you, you could be damaging them in that way. And therefore, the consequences, the negative consequences that you're going to receive from that are going to be the social consequences. Now, in regards to the harm by example point made before, Mill says we have a certain responsibility to bring up the next generation to have a certain degree of good character or good conduct towards others. And the reason Mill is more okay with people socially punishing things like drunkenness, idleness, uncleanliness, and con... 
because these are patterns of behavior that have been proven time and time and again to be harmful to the individual, or more specifically, to stifle happiness and individuality of character, which are the exact things that social freedom is meant to promote. And that is about where my audio cut out, but all I'm saying at the end here is that when society does overstep its bounds in interfering with the individual, we will sometimes see movements in which people go as far as to embody the entire opposite of what society is pushing on them. Mill gives the example of the Puritans reacting to Charles II, and I give the example of Green Day reacting to suburbs as a whole. And in these cases where society does overstep its bounds, or trying to actually force people to behave in a certain way, they are usually doing it as a result of them simply feeling weird about whatever they're doing. They simply feel that one way is the correct way to do things, and if somebody is doing something different, that uncomfortable feeling compels them to become the moral police. And this phenomenon of the moral police is one of the most universal of all human propensities. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and we will see you next time with our final chapter on applications.